three, two, one. And... Three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Today, I got Nick here, and I wanted to cover a big topic, which is something you'll research in the beginning of your van building journey, and that is how to choose the best van for a camper conversion. I got a couple of topics I'm going to go over with Nick because he's our expert today and he's in the process. He's built a van, he's building vans. And I wanted to touch a different, a few different points. Everything from why are you doing a van conversion? We're going to talk about budget, size, maintenance, mileage, safety, Yep, yep. all the different versions. But I guess the first question is how do you choose Nick? What are the options what are the where did you where did, would you start if you were brand new kind of maybe talk to us about that yeah so if i'm if i'm brand new and i'm trying to figure out what van to purchase the first thing is it's probably budget it's just like buying a car that's you got to find something that is affordable is it going to be your daily driver is it going to be something that you're only going to use on the weekends that's where i would start and then with that thought in mind get on youtube Watch a couple of videos because they might change your mind. They might say, oh, I didn't know I could actually use uh, this size van for a daily driver, but then also outfit the back of it to be used as a camper van. So once you decide what direction you're going, a daily driver or a weekender camper van, you can branch out from there and say, okay, now that I know how I'm traveling in this van, what do the capabilities need to be? Does it need to be normal size, extended, that sort of thing. Oh yeah, and yeah, jump in if you have any questions. Yeah, at, at, at the top of your head, what are the price ranges typically for different builds or if I'm looking to build a van, is it 5K, 10K, 50K, 100K? What are the different budgets people typically choose from? So you have the kind of bootstrapper, you have the couple looking to build something to do the full van life, not just part-time. Right. Or you have the max people that max it out. Maybe they're retirees or something, or just people that go out to Moab or whatever. I don't know. Tell me the different budgets and pe what people are looking to do with it. So if you're getting started, find out your budget and find out your use. Okay. That would be the first thing. Are you a weekender? Or do you live in your van? That's it. There's two things. Now, are you got a couple options? Are you going to buy an old Ford van, little V8 van, fix it up on the inside? It's old, but you're happy because you like the classic look or whatever. The Econoline? What yeah, that? like a Ford Econoline. Is that kind of your style? Or are you a little bit more... Are you looking for something that's newer, possibly more reliable because you're not that good with car parts and stuff like that, which is completely cool. So you want to get something new to feel safer on these long distance trips. That's cool. So on the left side, you got the Econoline. You can get that used Craigslist dealership. And so after that point, upfitting the van is pretty much the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to we'll equalize everything. So whether you go with the old van or you go with a new ProMaster Transit or Sprinter and you've got those vans, now you're on the next step. And this is capabilities. So your old van, do you want it to be two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive based on where you're going? Your new van, do you want it to be two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive? Then you can step up from there. Now you're really at an equal playing field. And now you're just focused on the interior parts of the van. So that is where you're going to sleep. Are you going to cook inside your van? What about it, size? So size people. would be based Number on... Of people. Yep, yep. So size would be weekends or living in your van, as well as if you're solo or you're a couple, that sort of thing. So that would be the next tier up. And that's where you need to talk about space. Now... Some people are different. Some people need the big old van, and then some people like the small, more minimalistic type of van. What is big old van square foot wise? Or is that the extended Mercedes? 
Tight. Yeah, so the the language is not really square foot. It would be more how many feet long is the vehicle? Oh, okay. So you're like 20, 24 feet, that type of thing. That's how it goes. And there's usually typically three different sizes of vans. There's your standard van, which is the short wheelbase, medium wheelbase, and long wheelbase. So short wheelbase, the rear axle of the van will almost be like at the very back of the van. It'll look funny. It's like a little mini minivan. No, not a minivan. Don't say it. That's small weird. van. That's very confusing because a minivan is actually a completely different van. Some people do van life in minivans, but that's not what we're talking about. So you got the short axle. The medium axle, that is your typical van on the road, our typical cargo van. The extended wheelbase or elongated version, those are the ones that you see that are typically like the Amazon vans where the... You have a long, you have a long axle, so typically like around 140 in- inches of the axle, and then the back of it, you have this, you have this big old kind of butt hanging out, and that's your extended. So that would be the full size. Oh yeah, I can use my hands. So you got your short axle, medium axle, and then extended long. And people like the short ones because, for example, a lot of uh, solo female travelers. They like to go with the shorter axle. And this is not specific to females in general. This is just, it's a, a van that can be overwhelming. Anybody you can go more van. places with a smaller one? Well, it's not just going more places. Imagine you've been driving a car like your whole life, whatever. Some people have never driven a van. It's, it's Sometimes it's extremely intimidating. That's really the, the number one thing. And so a lot, a lot of female solo travelers, that they, they want to do the the whole van life thing but they want to get into if they're going to solo they, they want to be able to feel confident in driving the vehicle they don't want to feel you know scared like a semi truck driver well scared that they turn it and then this big old thing that they're not used to goes all over the place and so size can influence who's what type of driver a lot of drivers are comfortable female drivers are comfortable with typically right. maybe the smaller van than- the smaller vans it's just easy to maneuver it's easy to get into parking spaces. I mean, it's both male and female, but female van lifers, the only reason I'm specifically saying that is because if you are not comfortable with a van, it's a great idea to get a smaller van. It's easier to work on, easier to drive, all that good stuff. When you get into the bigger vans, they can get really big. You're talking like 25 feet long. So if you're comfortable driving something like that, cool. But And what size is medium? So medium is what I got. Your vans back behind you are medium? Yeah, these are medium. These are not the extended. So if I can go... Oh, they're high top. That's that's what's different. Yeah. So if I go to... Let's see this one. And usually in size directly corresponds with budget. If it's, long, if it's something newer. Yep. Obviously. And let's see. We got a... Here's a good example. Oh, that's a good picture. This is this Far Out Ride website, they're awesome. They've just got content for days to help you understand. So if you look at this, so this van that's shown is my personal van. However, if you notice where the taillight is, this is the short wheelbase. So when this sliding door bar intersects with the taillight, that's the short wheelbase. And you guys can go down and see the tire. Regular wheelbase, 129 inches. So my van, it's low roof, but it goes boop right there. It goes to 20 feet long, and that is a 148-inch wheelbase. This is 147.6, but everyone knows it as 148. Uh, can you scroll up just a, like a half an inch to see the, there it is, yeah. high roof, medium roof, low roof. Oh, okay. I see that now. Let's do this. There we go. So mine is right here. And then... You move your mouse a little bit. You got to do a circle with it when you're talking about. Right here. Oh, okay. And then I'll have to turn that feature on, make it pop up big. Okay. So right here, the back of the van, this is my van. So short, 
medium, and then here's the long. So the long wheelbase is going to be 22 feet. And that's really long. It's all it has more hanging over. And you can see where the tire is. So notice all of that real estate back there. Male or female, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's more about as a driver, what are you comfortable with? Have you driven a Honda Civic your whole life? Or are you a pickup truck driver and you kind of feel okay about trucks? Because turning this right here with this end is way different than turning with this end. Is this, is this, are these sizes only true for Mercedes, Sprinter vans, and Ford? Does Dodge have something similar? Yeah, so the, the market is pretty much going to be standardized because if we go to the Ram Pro Master. Does it have the three different sizes? Oh, yeah. Because it's, there's, uh, they, they all have to be competitive. So they're, they're almost exactly the same. The only thing that's different. So can we get into the differences off the top of your head for each one? Yeah. So we got, so for example, ProMaster, same thing, 136. Right here, see it's got the short end. They got 159, so instead of 148, they've got a, here we go. Actually it has a couple, has four instead of three. So they get the 118 inch, very tiny. Got the 159, that's typical, oh sorry, 136. What's more typical is the 159. And then the really big one is the 150, uh, I'm sorry. No, they have three, 159. What people really enjoy about the ProMaster is the width of the van. So the interior width is huge, 75.6, whereas the, it doesn't, it's not gonna show the width here, yeah. So this one, and it doesn't actually show the width. I forgot what the width is here. Anyway, the Sprinter is not as, the Transit is not as wide as the ProMaster, very wide. And believe it or not, the Sprinter, the Sprinter van is the smallest, on the interior is the smallest. If you notice, same lingo here, same jargon, 144, 170, 170, EXT is extended. So you can see, so what the manufacturer is doing is they're taking the axle and they're sliding it back. Oh, I was muted, sorry. Oh, Are fine. you talking about width? Uh, I'm talking about width and length. So width-wise, the Mercedes is the smallest. Next would be the Transit. Then the widest would be the ProMaster. And then Mercedes follows along the same thing. So let's let's talk about differences, not just size. Why do people choose usually one brand over the other? What's the typical factors choosing a Mercedes or a Ford or a ProMaster? So the, the different reasons is it just might be your brand. You're a Ford guy. You're a Mercedes guy or girl. And uh, the Ram ProMaster just... Being extremely honest, it is not the most comfortable van. I've driven, I've test driven the van. It is not comfortable for, for long rides. Some people might have a different opinion. I've driven one. It's not comfortable. The seating height is so high. Uh, I'm six feet tall and I'm where I'm at in the van is the roof is right here and the windshield is like right in front of my face. The main reason people like to buy the ProMasters is because of their price. And so ProMaster, if you go to, let's see here. I'm trying to find ProMaster here. So they start at $32,000. So they're extremely, they're very affordable in the van world. And you can start building yeah, pretty quickly budget wise. 
Okay, so what? Let's go to. Uh, so we'll just so, do this real quick. So Ford Transit. Ford Transit. What's the? Why do people like building in Ford Transits? Let's see here. Hold on, we're just gonna knock out this price real real quick. So they're all starting at the same price, but I will tell you, it goes up really quick. So typically, forty two. So so Ram is that. This is a one thirty six inch. So that's the catch. So one thirty six inch for thirty two. The crew van. Let's just call it like thirty eight. And then Mercedes Sprinter, the Mercedes price. So notice how the industry has set this up for advertising. It's very uh, important to look at this. You'll look at three of them, 32, 35, 36. Okay, so oh, they're all the same. That's, this, is a, this is a high roof for 32. This is a mid roof for 34, and the Sprinter is a low roof for 36. So pay attention because until you get up into these cargo vans and you go to, to build it, this is, for Mercedes, you think that's a deal, 36,000, this is what you're getting. You're not getting the van life van because you need to go up to at least the 144. And then once you do 144, six cylinder so all the upgrades actually change the story right i do like how mercedes visualizes this for you because this is exactly what you need to pay attention to low roof not really considered van life 144 that's your normal that's what people this is what the winnebago revel is built out of that sort of thing six cylinder diesel or four cylinder diesel these are pretty typical even the four cylinder gas but notice what happens. You are building a van. You're putting, you're building the inside of it. You're putting furniture in, all that stuff. So, you, I would not suggest you ever go with a fifteen hundred. This, the class has to do with your weight capacity. Fifteen hundred, twenty five, thirty five. So if you notice, engines are directly related to how much weight the van can haul which makes complete sense they're related. so weight they're related weight is also a factor not just size yeah and length also the weight so think of wheelbase roof height this is livability powertrain is moving where you're living and then also where you're going so you're just on strict highways six cylinder would be fine maybe the 3500 series but if you get these so these are your payload capacities so payload is that's your battery system your sink your water storage your bed system your interior panels your upholstery your vent fan it's all the nuts and bolts that you put in the van to make it livable this is what you can do to get this number to figure it out you can take your van that's hollow you can take it to a truck stop on a cat scale and you can weigh it and saying, okay, here's my weight. All right. And you can rent a van from Enterprise Rent-A-Car, all that stuff. You can just rent a van, take it, get it weighed, and then you start to get an idea of maybe what you need to buy or what you anticipate you need to buy. I'll finish this thought here in just a second. Hey, this it's, is what full, it's all yours. Yeah, this is what you're living in. This is the engine you need to haul your but across the U.S. to go travel. If you're going to, my suggestion is like a 144 range, a six cylinder does not have to be diesel. Just happens to be that Mercedes, this is what they do. And 3,500, 3,500 is worth it. You don't want to be so close on this edge that a hundred, couple hundred pounds payload is going to mess you up because you can actually see there's only 500 pounds between these two. But if you move up, this is quite significant. Because instead of- What 50, about- uh, Hold on, so let me finish that thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 3,500. All right, so notice how marketing-wise they got you on this 36. And you're like, I can get a Mercedes for 36. Well, actually, the van you're gonna live in, how you're gonna be able to haul it, and to make it safe so that your van is not 
over its GVRW. That's a legal thing, by the way. So it's not only safety, but that's how our road system is paid for. So you are taxed on the amount of weight your tires are putting on the the ground. But at the same time, it correlates with safety because if you're above this number, engineering-wise, that van is not designed to take turns, the bearings, the axles, the tires. You're not safe. And there's a lot of vans on the road that are above GVRW, which is, it's scary, but it's because people don't know this or they tried to skimp and say that's okay i'll I'll just get the four cylinder and i'll do this one because i need to save money but then you load up the whole entire van with something like this it looks good it moves but it's not safe it would it's dangerous so notice we how we went from 36 to 45 and then here's the ultimate van life adventure van build 144 4x4 diesel not 2,500, you probably need the 3,500 extra duty. So once we click on that, notice how we went from 36,000 to now we're at $58,480. Why diesel? So again, like I said earlier, diesel doesn't matter. This just happens to be how Mercedes sells this uh, four by four. You can't- Oh, the four by four, got it. Yeah, so the Ford Transit, those are the ones that I'm building. What I like about them is you can get them in uh, uh, four-wheel drive. Let's see here. See, Ford, you need to improve this. Let's see, that was very difficult, so I'm just not even going to use it. So four by four. Now you're into now, guys. This is just the price of the van with nothing in it. This is just a van. This is nothing. This is no interior. This is no water. Nothing. It's just the van. So that is why people go. So long story short, let's get back to the whole reason we talked about this. That's why this right here, 32,000 for a high roof, 136, 2,500 cargo van. That's why a lot of, that's why a lot of vans people doing professional and DIYers are getting this Ram Promaster. Might not be as comfortable. It doesn't have four-wheel drive. It is a front-wheel drive vehicle, so it's not a rear-wheel drive like the Transit. It's a front-wheel drive. Technically, front-wheel drive does better in snowy conditions because the engine weight is directly on the tire. And for snow traction, having more weight on the tires helps traction for snow. That's not necessarily, that's not the same with mud. Okay, so let me get back out of here, and Jamie can ask the next question. Safety, mileage, safety. Do these factor into your decision, or or are these vans pretty similar in their performance and safety? So the whole old story of unreliable cars and stuff like that, that's kind of gone. Anything that's older than, I say, 2005-ish is going to be extremely reliable regardless of the mileage. The cars, you mean 2005 or newer? Yeah. Really, any car is going to do pretty good. 100,000 miles. If you're buying some, a van with 100,000 miles and it's like a FedEx delivery van or like UPS uh, or something like that, because FedEx uses them, Amazon uses them, these style vans, you got to remember... All these vans do is they just get up in the morning, throw stuff in the back, they make deliveries, and they come back. They're regularly maintained, oil changes, tires, and stuff like that. They might have a couple little dents and dings, but yeah, the engine reliability is pretty high. So I would not take mileage into account as heavy as if you were in the mindset of buying a used car for your family at your home. It's not the same with a van because cargo vans they're made everything every component is just a little bit tougher a little bit tougher for because it's what about safety in terms of the transit the sprinter the pro master what about safety Uh, is that something to consider in my opinion this is just my opinion they're all equal they all they have airbags they got anti-lock brakes um you know so here's a factor that's been you can tell a story about when 
looking for a van to convert, availability is a factor. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can shed light on availability of a van. Yeah, so right now, as we're making this video, van availability is, it is rare right now, and it's confusing because a consumer, it's hard for a consumer to go to a dealership and order a van right now and have to actually get something on order because there's this word called allocation. And what allocation me means is it's pretty much your place in line compared to it's your place, place in line. So obviously dealerships are going to have the first place in line. A certified upfitters may have the second place in line. Even professional van builders, they might be third in line. And then you ordering from your Ford dealership might be fourth in line or something like that. So allocation has a big – allocation is the rule that everybody kind of plays by of who gets the van coming off the assembly line, who who gets to have that. And it's weird because I've caught a bunch of businesses. I've gone to dealerships myself personally. I've done the whole thing, bought those two vans. And there's really not a straightforward answer because, for example, the interior conversion kit that I'm putting in, it's the Adventure Wagon interior conversion kit. They actually got allocation for some Mercedes vans, which is, that's really cool. Like, that's super cool that they were able to get that. But other van builders that I watch on YouTube, they've had, they're going, they're a business, but they've had to go on the right, the route of more like a consumer purchases in the van. So that's so Odyssey owns these two vans, but the way that I had to find them was I had to it probably took me four months, maybe five months to find just those two vans last year. The reason it was so hard was all the major dealerships had zero for sale. I went to a dealership out of outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I pulled up and I'm smiling and I'm like, what is going on? And they had three hundred Ford Transits on their lot. Three hundred white vans. You're just like, oh, <laughs> I'll just I'll walk in here, buy a van. Mm -hmm. Every single one of those vans was already bought and paid for by FedEx. Every single one of those three hundred vans were just they just needed a place they were just waiting to get like the FedEx stickers and have an upfitter put in the shelving for packages. They had all so Get back to allocation, hundreds and hundreds of vans have all been allocated to FedEx and Amazon and all that stuff. So thinking you're going to go to a dealership and get a van, uh, man, that's... So in the, so that will be, that will factor into, okay, what size you get, budget, but also budget might not help because you might have to change what you're looking for because of availability. You might go through that example that I just showed you and you're like, okay, Nick, thanks. I'm going to get the 144. I'm going to get the, the four by four. I'm going to get this. And then, so you get your piece of paper. And you're like, oh, this is what I want. And then you have to completely change your mind because nope, those are not available. Your first option, not available. Your plan B, not available. Well, what's my plan C? It's like, so well, this could be a good segue. Yeah. And this so this could segue into pre-built. Do you do you buy pre-built or do you do you DIY? What's how do you decide which road to go for that? Yeah. So what I've been viewing on viewing is so my personal van that I drive. It was a, it's a DIY, DIY van. I built it out and. There's couples that are doing DIY, so they're personally buying the van. It's obviously not a business or anything, so they're financing the van completely, like they're like they're buying a, a car, just like mm -hmm. they're buying a car. Um, what's cool is if you do the personal financing, uh, you can actually like State Farm is actually known right now for easily insuring personal vans to be upfitted. And that's another topic we can talk about. Maybe I'll just do a quick blurb on it. But imagine you got the van and you build it and then you didn't even think about, oh, yeah, how am I going to insure this van? Because legally, 
when you convert your van, it is no longer passenger vehicle. It is a, it's, a, it's considered an RV. And if you get your van and you upfit the interior of it and you don't claim it as an RV, it may not be, co- when you get in a car accident, it may not be covered because you were not up front with the insurance company to say, okay, I'm buying this van for the purposes of upfitting it. And there's a process where you can say, hey, here's the van. I'm going to turn it into this. You got like an example picture. And then you can do a progress build, which is showing pictures of the van. Uh, And then when you're done with the van conversion, a State Farm, for example, will just flip a switch. And it went from uh, cargo van to uh, RV. The cool thing about that is if you do it right, you've got documentation for what needs to be insured in the van. And number two, you have a lower premium on RVs. They're cheaper than a than normal car insurance because the idea is that it's on the weekends. You're driving it on the weekend. It's not a daily driver. But all those topics you can discuss with your insurance agency. I'm not a professional here. I'm just someone who has highly researched all this so that when my... Customers who want to buy a van say, hey, Nick, what do I do here and here? Or whoever's watching this video, I can give you what I've researched to kind of so, to help you out. So with the DIY, you will have to do some work on getting it insured from a regular car, cargo to a RV. Maybe talk about build price differences of DIY. I imagine it can range from low to high, and then pre-built is more probably has a certain ceiling or maybe it doesn't tell me about budgets for those two so budget how people look at diy versus pre buying a pre-built like a revel gotcha so when i was an engineer there was a sign on this this one supervisor shop and it was a big old sign it was always funny because it was for the other departments who wanted help from him they had to read it every time they walked into a shop and he said if you want it if you want it good and fast it won't be cheap if you want it cheap and good it won't be fast and if you want it fast and cheap it won't be good (laughs) use that for how you're going to approach it if you're doing a diy you can do it slow and good but it won't be fast and so that is my advice to diyers is you're going to be paid you need to be patient Uh, a a typical diyer is going to take about a year to build their van so one year so you buy the van in a year you'll probably have it to where you would like it where people go to the pre-built option, you get a lot of benefits to a pre-built option. One, depending on who you purchase it from, there's- So I just wanted to stop here. So it takes a year probably because you have a job and a life. Is that why? That's why you're saying it takes a year? Yes. And even if you had time devoted to it, there's a learning, there's a whole learning curve that's happening while you're building the van. Ah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Because you can be just like like all of us where you can buy it off of Amazon. It gets to your door in two days. But Amazon's not bad. Remember, you can buy from the manufacturer through Amazon. Just make sure that the seller is like Battleborn batteries or something. Make sure it's the seller, the store seller is the company. Make sure you get it from the company. Okay, sorry. Go back to your Revel. This is the pre-built. Pre-built. So I got some words on the Rebel. I've been to a bunch of shows and stuff like that. I've got to see it. I haven't gotten to drive one, but... I liked it. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, has to do with quality. So when you get a pre-built van, number one, you're having your your touch. It has like whatever your aesthetics are. It's not going to be that. It's going to be whatever the you know, company designed to be mass produced for scale, pricing, all that good stuff. So you might have to hold back on details and then do that later. But uh, so quality might be the issue where you can get the van quickly, but it might not be, you might have to change a couple things to really make it your own, which is okay. You might want to go that route because you're like- The DIY will have more personality. Yeah, I'll have more personality, but buying the van quickly, this is where the economies of scale comes into play because pricing, 
availability, even warranty work. So buying it from like Winnebago, they actually have repair centers. And uh, I'm gonna go on a quick tangent about the, that whole thing. So me personally, building these vans out here, my philosophy is when you build a van, it is, you're building a van for, you're, I'm building a van for you to take out into the wilderness. So there are no repair stores, there's no mechanics, there's no garage. So if you take one of my vans out, like it's supposed to be taken out into the wilderness, you need to have the systems and components be up to par for that type of environment, such as lithium batteries that might have an, uh, a battery heater to keep them warm. So then when you're snowed in and the solar panels are taking in that light, that you can still charge your batteries even though it's 20 degrees outside, just for example. So even though vans that you may buy from a manufacturer have those warranty programs, God forbid you ever have to use that because if you're 200, 300 miles out in Utah or you're up in Canada, if you're going to like Alaska or whatever, the last thing you need is some type of failure. And what I've seen in, these are just YouTube videos and just me researching all this stuff for the, over the past two years. There's a couple corners cut, maybe a little bit like electrical wiring, pumps, interior panels that are not like little grommets and stuff breaking. It's all these little things, but you think if you put that much money into a vehicle, I'm talking about other, not Winnebago specifically, but that whole industry of the pre-builds. If you build your own van, I think you have a little bit more control of that. If you buy your van from a professional van builder that you're in contact with and you can grow with a project, you'll really understand how your van is built so that if a problem does arise, you have a little bit more, you're a little bit more empowered to say, hey, Nick, walk me through this. I know where this goes. I think we can fix this like this. Whereas Winnebago, uh, I'm not hating on Winnebago, it's just, the videos I've seen steer more to that direction. There was a YouTuber and he's doing like a full review of it. And he was actually speaking to uh, one of the technicians at Winnebago and- We have a video too, when we toured at Winnebago. You do? No, we do, from the- Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> from- Man. Wait, there's, there's a lot Adventure of- Adventure Land. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, sorry, Adventure Van. Adventure Land. <laughs> Adventure Van. Adventure Van. We have a video. Yeah. Look, check out that video. I just want to be honest in what I've seen because I think it's so important. If if the company you're buying it from, again, that brand that I keep talking about right now, I don't want to keep using their name, but if, if you go to pick it up and somebody can't walk through every switch, every fuse, every like thing with you there, and they don't really understand it. It's just like, well, this is kind of, you know, this is what it is. Um, that's a red flag. If you're a hands-on person like me, if it breaks, I'm just going to fix it. But if you're somebody who... A normie like me. Yeah, like Jamie, for example. He's going to go out with his family. And I'm, I'm going to poke fun at Jamie for a second. So let's just say he was the guy that drove a Civic forever. So now he's in a van. So Ford Fusion. Ford Fusion, Okay. So now he's in uh, a Ford Transit. He's never driven a big van, so that's the first thing that he's working on. He hasn't installed or replaced battery systems or water pumps. That's the second thing. He's got his whole family. He's out on the road, and the whole reason he bought the vehicle was to have a good time with his family. But if you've, and this is why like the professional van builder, builders that are across the the U.S. with these kind of small shops is you can be with the builder and watch the progress builds, like the videos like I make, for example. And by the time you get your van, you know how this was installed, how this was installed, where this product came from. You're more competent and comfortable versus the alternative might be less about how to not it's, fix things, but what's it, going on. It's that thing that doesn't exist anymore. It's the relationship. That whole joke of a car dealership, we're like, oh, we want to have a relationship with our customers. It's and not, not mm, that's, no, no. I don't think that's the definition they're using. But what I'm saying is with independent van builders, you can, you 100% can have that. You can have that relationship. So 
the two or three months it takes to do the build, you get progress updates, you got the build. So it's kind of like you're in between a DIY pre-built being a custom van upfitter because yeah. they get you get some influence on the build mm -hmm. as where a pre-built's already set in stone. And then not only that, but there are also, I guess we'll call them independent van builders like myself, where you can have a customer bring in a vehicle that may be a partial build. So they're like, hey, Nick, I love this sink. This is the sink I want. I already went and bought my toilet. I bought my water tank, but I don't know how to hook it up. And then I can take it from there. I, that's that relationship I'm talking about because like a, a great example of this is uh, Humble Road. So he's he's got a YouTube channel. He's a professional van builder. And I see through his videos that he has that relationship so that when things break, a van is a blank canvas. You're creating something that's never been created before. So there, there are going to be problems. Now, they're not going to be huge problems. They might just be like, like a screw or something that you and the client dreamed up in your head. It's never existed in reality. And you try it, and then maybe you have to tweak it after a road trip or something. So the reason I'm harping on the whole relationship thing is if everybody's on the same page going into it, being like, okay, Nick, I like this cool shower concept you design. You're both on the same page that it's a one-off design. There might be some tweaks that have to happen after a year of it being on the road. So I see that in his videos. The client's really happy that that communication is open. And then that feedback is important because not only does it help the relationship, but in the future, it's like, hey, I, we made these few tweaks because I got feedback from you know, the four vans I got on the road that this works the best. Stuff like that. Is I got a, maybe we can, I know each one of these topics are, probably are an hour or so each we could do. Yeah, yeah. Just to wrap up the, this call in understanding how to choose you know the best van for your camper conversion where to look how do people find vans any sites you can recommend or sites dealerships what how, how do people find their van i'll tell you how i found these two vans because i think it's the best way now okay that's in my case i, I need hollow shells of a van i don't, I don't want a pre-built pre -built van obviously so, so we're looking for empty cargo vans. Yep. So what I did is I went to all the major dealerships first and nothing. Then the ones, then I went to, went to auto trader, car gurus and stuff like this. And then you can find these because these are, this is a rare, these two vans are very rare because. At the moment. Oh, no, they're just rare in general because of okay. the build. Because number one, they are 148 high roof they're not extended high roof they're 148 high roof that's the sought after van because it's not huge in the rear end you can still park it in a parking space number two one of them has the ego boost turbocharged v6 so having a 148 high roof with the turbocharged v6 that's rare what's ultra rare is having a 148 high roof eco boost all-wheel drive it's like you keep getting that. And then what makes the fan number one even more rare is that it's got the full technology package and it has all real leather uh, interior, you know, all right. black. How did so, you find, how did you find, where did you look for your van? How did you find it? Oh, like I was saying, auto trader, car gurus, these ad sites. If you're looking for, if you're a customer looking for more of a pre-built, van or something that's been st already started van life trailer uh, ugh, van life trader rv trader is facebook marketplace or craigslist or is that not recommended or i don't think those are helpful because the problem with craigslist is sometimes the ad lives on to like forever so you're basically looking at stuff and getting excited when there's a freshness that well no probably maybe somebody's already bought it it's just the listing has just lived on. And then Van Life Trader, uh, unless you know who's building it, that's questionable because what's nice is I bought these vans from the dealership. So nobody else has owned these vans. They're technically new. So those websites you listed, look at the dealerships 
any other if you're buying um, a if you're buying a van new or slightly used go to the dealership first you might spend more money but the problem the but the benefit of that is its source you know how that van has been come through the channels if you go on like auto trader car gurus or craigslist or whatever or van life trader those channels that's probably a for sale by owner i got these at i got there were two dealerships one is in ohio one was in ohio and the other one was illinois i think and the one in ohio was a normal size dealership and then the one and Illinois was like a very small dealership, I think, or something like that. And it was a little bit more of a manual process. They had a handwritten sales quote on an old school type of paper. They're really old school sales guys. It was carbon cool. copy, yellow. Oh, no, it was it was carbon copy. Now I'm not lying. But I had next day air carbon copy stuff that I signed, which it was that's wild because everything else nostalgic. That, everything else I've done is always you're on the internet clicking stuff. Yeah, but they, these are rare in demand vans, which is nice platform to start from but i'd say these are more of i would call it a higher end build just because of the components that are going into it so the reason it's all-wheel drive the turbocharged v6 type of thing that kind of goes with where my direction is whereas if you were a consumer and you were on a budget we get back to that whole conversation of the ram pro master or like used ford transit like a fedex van or something like that Got it. Well, I think we can wrap up today on how to choose the best van for your camper <laughs> conversion. Nick, I appreciate you sharing all these topics. The website, the blog will be up probably maybe a week after this comes out mm-hmm. or so. But yeah, these were great, great information. But yeah, if you're any other, any other things you want to promote, mention no, just, um, yeah, check out the uh, the Van Builder HQ. It's a resource there for you to to learn about everything that I'm doing in the shop. It's a bird's eye view of everything that's going on here as far as how I'm building and installing things. And really, this again, it's a resource. So if you guys have any questions, send us those questions. Put them in the comments. Um, however you're seeing this video. We answer all questions. We answer. <laughs> we'll make a video on every question. And, uh, yeah, but hope you guys enjoyed it and i'll see you in the next one see ya